what's more dangerous being obese or being a bodybuilder and i'm like if you take bodybuilding to the extreme or obesity to the extreme they're equal hey everyone i'm abby sharp welcome to my new series fed up Every episode, I will be sitting down with a fellow influencer or content creator to ask some super tough questions and have real uncensored, unscripted discussions without the shame and judgment. Cause I say we are all a little fed up. Everybody betrayed me. I fed up with this world. So today I'm gonna be tackling one of the most unexpected collabs of all time. I'm gonna be talking to one of YouTube's most popular fitness creators, Greg Doucette. Now, before we dive in, I want to remind you to check out my disclaimer, including a trigger warning to those with past or previous experiences with disordered eating. I also want to remind you guys all to subscribe to this channel and ring that bell so that you never miss out on an episode. Do it now before you forget. Hey, Greg, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to chat with you. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to this. Been looking forward to it for a week. Yes. Now, First and foremost, um, this might be the most unexpected video collaboration of all time. And I feel like we need to clear the air a bit. So for those who might not know what I'm referring to, can you elaborate on what our previous interactions were like? Well, absolutely. So first of all, Abby watched one of my videos or a few videos and made a video compilation of what I was eating. And at the time I was dieting for a bodybuilding contest and I was like shredded and hardly eating, starving myself. So she put together a video of what Greg eats like. And I watched the video and I was like, that doesn't really represent what I eat like. And it kind of made it look like I promote starving and that I'm like a horrible person for promoting like starvation diets and you gotta be shredded and 5%. And so it kind of gave the audience a, a feeling of like, this guy is a jerk. Like we don't want to follow this guy. But I was happy to see so many people writing in the comments. You know, I had a lot of videos out and they're like, actually, if you watch more of his videos, it's not really what he's like overall, but like to your defense, Anyone that first starts watching me is like, who the heck is this guy? Why is he screaming so much? And what is he doing? But after like five or 10 videos, they kind of get used to it. So that's kind of what happened. So I made a trilogy of videos back and forth. It looked like a Netflix documentary, kind of like the shark attack. Oh my God, is this clawing? And, and so all these people did videos. So we went back and forth quite a bit. And so it's been a year. I've watched so many more of your videos and you actually think a lot more like me than I ever thought. And I'm like, wait a minute, we actually kind of agree on a lot of this stuff. So that was interesting to see. So it's been a year and now I'm on your channel being interviewed. So shocking but here i am yeah i think i mean like you said like we've both grown so much and i definitely have come to appreciate that we kind of say a lot of the same things we just say them differently and to recap for those who don't know how do you describe yourself as a content creator because i mean there may be a lot of people who are watching right now who've never watched your channel before i think most people get the wrong impression at first they think i'm some kind of bodybuilder that's just gonna like scream at you and try to get you shredded and to get you jacked but really i'm more of a weight loss channel that i promote having balance and getting to a healthy weight and not being unrealistic and i give a lot of tips on how to lose weight Weight, how to train in the gym and how to have a diet that you can sustain for the rest of your life. Totally. And do you think that the internet like YouTube likes to pit wellness content creators against each other for like the spectacle of it all? And I don't know, like, do we feed into that? What do you think? Absolutely. I did several videos in regards to your video. I could have given the exact same information that I gave in those videos, but without your name in the title and without the kind of back and forth going on. And it would have got half the views because people want to see one person go against the other. And so when you made that video, it literally helped me because it gave me such great content to talk about. So anything that you said about my diet, I could say, wait, wait, wait no, no, no this is what I actually think, or, or you're right here, but here you, you missed that. So it gives you the opportunity to explain yourself by using someone else's name. You get double the views as if you just kind of presented the information because people don't want to go to school again. They're bored of school. They want a little bit more drama, a little bit more excitement, not boring. And you notice when I speak in interviews, I'm not like 
quiet. When I do these uh, these uh, YouTube videos, I'm kind of amped up, a little bit more excited. I think people like that. They want to enjoy, they want to be entertained. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I like to think about my content as infotainment. So obviously I'm coming at all of my, my, my videos with science. Um, I'm big on science. I'm big on the research and evidence, but of course, like you got to get in there with the clickbait. You got to make it dramatic. You got to make it somewhat sensationalized or else people are just not going to watch. And so that's always been my approach. I think that there is so much misinformation out there on the internet. So I need to be equally as enticing as a content creator. But of course, when you get to the video, I'm still there kind of driving down the facts. So yeah, do you feel like you're doing kind of like the same, you got the same approach? Yeah, I like to call out the BS. I like to call out the what's, what's lies. I call it more spews for more views. People get away with that all the time. It seems like it's not the smartest people who are the most popular on YouTube. It's usually it's usually the best looking people with the best body. So maybe that's what we have. Maybe we're a little bit of the attractive people. But I mean, you really need to have a personality to make up for like not being drop dead good looking. Like I used to say on the Richter scale, you have to be like a 9.9 .9 attractive. And if you are, you can say anything. V shred, look at my abs, buy my things and, and you can make millions of dollars. But for the normal person, it's like, how are you gonna stand out? You have to have some kind of personality, but still provide scientific information because you can give all the science information you want with your PhDs, but if you say it in a boring manner, no one's tuning in. Yeah, totally. Now, obviously I take a more kind of like intuitive eating approach to diet and food, but I'm really curious, are you completely against intuitive eating for everyone? Or like, do you think that there are any merits involved? And like, would intuitive eating as you understand it ever be a goal for you? I think overall intuitive eating is great for people who have amazing genetics. So they're just the people that they're already at a healthy weight. They pretty much can eat what they want and it works for them. So why shouldn't they intuitively eat? But for other people who are struggling with their weight and it's not easy for them, they need to be that much more careful with what they're eating. Kind of like in school, if you're a genius, you don't really need to study that much. It's going to work. But if you have special needs, you really need to know how exactly do you learn? Are you a visual learner? Um, do you need hands-on approach? So with dieting, I see it the same thing. The, the worse your genetics are, the more you need to rely on some kind of a plan to get through it. If you do a lot of cardio, you can get away with a lot more, like I'm racing bicycles, so I can eat a lot of calories. So I don't need to count every calorie, every macro like some people do. So for me, I'm somewhere in the middle. I mindfully eat. Um, I don't see me as ever just saying like, I'm just eating and I just whatever. I'll always want to have somewhat of a, uh, I would say I want to maintain an above average physique, not a perfect physique, but something that I'm proud of. And so I think I'll always, I'm 45, I think on, I don't know, who knows in 40 years, hopefully I make it that long, but I would say I'm always going to be a mindful eater. Yeah. And I mean, I think that uh, intuitive eating is not for everyone. And I say that in all of my videos on intuitive eating because intuitive eating is not a weight loss diet. So if you are going into intuitive eating and I get messages about this every single day, oh, can I lose weight doing intuitive eating? I say, you might lose weight. You might stay the same weight. You might gain weight. It really depends on the person and where their body wants to be. Um, and also their starting point in their relationship with food. It's so much more complex than that. So I think that, like I said, it's just, it's not for everyone, but I think that we can pick up certain of these, some of these principles and tenets and apply them to our eating. Um, things like, like basic things, like move your body in a way that feels good to it and respect your body and things like that. I think that those are universal principles that we can all kind of benefit from, but I don't think that intuitive eating in its entirety as a movement or an approach to eating is for everybody to, to kind of take Yeah, I really, I really feel like intuitive eating, if you're already overweight and you're not really active, it's very unlikely that it's gonna solve your problems. But if you're someone who's very active, you're exercising, you're training, or you're an athlete, so to speak, that it's probably gonna work for you. Like it really comes down to how active do you, are you and are you in fact overweight and is weight loss your main concern? If it is, probably not the best strategy for you. Yeah, and the same goes for underweight too. I mean, people who are chronically, like if the, you have an active eating disorder, 
I say to people all the time, no, you cannot just jump into intuitive eating because you probably have blunted your hunger cues so severely that you can't trust those hunger cues because people who don't eat enough, they have reduced their metabolism down to a, like a snail's pace. So for them to listen to their body to tell them that it's time to eat, they may not get that cue. And so that's how people kind of get into this reinforcement that, oh, well, I'm not hungry. I'm listening to my body, so I must be eating enough. Well, when you're eating 800 calories, that is not enough. So we kind of need to, for a lot of people who are just getting started healing that relationship with their hunger and fullness, they need to have what we call mechanical eating, which is like a cast where it's basically a meal plan for them to eat regularly every few hours so that they can start to he like start to rebuild those hunger cues before they just like jump right in to intuitive eating. So yeah. I think that, that yeah, is... people I've worked with who are who are clearly underweight, like you know, 70, 80, 90 pounds and whatnot, BMIs below 15. It's very difficult to convince them to eat more. So if I just said, just eat intuitively, just kind of like they'll eat even less than they're eating. They need to have almost like a a calorie minimum. I'm like, no matter what you do, you need to eat this minimum goal somehow because I can't have you continue to lose weight because it's already dangerous at this point. So. I find it very challenging to work with people that are really severely underweight. It's it's a completely different, I would say 95% of the people I work with are people that want to lose weight. So when it's somebody that needs to gain, it's like the opposite uh, training that I need to give them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're right, they, they absolutely do need to have uh, structure and and some basically a, a, a meal plan, a minimum in place to, to encourage them to get those calories in so that they can get those hunger cues back. And it is a bit of a long process for some people. So yeah. And it's very difficult to get them to try different foods. Like they don't want to eat anything that they're not used to, that they haven't tried. That's not like people are talking about, well, should labels have calories at restaurants? No, they shouldn't because that messes. And I'm like, the people that I'm coaching who are underweight will not eat something at a restaurant without the calories listed. They just don't dare. So having those calories, at least it gives them the knowledge for them to make that educated decision. So for me, I'm 100% in favor of every restaurant should have the calories listed to all the food. And some people are like, no, as soon as you put calories, it, it's gonna trigger people to not eat because they'll know the calories. I'm like, yeah, but you should make that choice. Like, I should know if there's alcohol, what percent in the alcohol I'm drinking so that I don't get too drunk and drive home. It's like, it should be there as information to help us. Yeah, you know, I don't disagree. I think that knowledge is power and having information, more information is better than less information. Um, but I'm curious, you mentioned working with people who are severely underweight, 15, BM, like a BMI of 15, 16, etc. Do you feel with your education equipped to deal with the psycho psychological element of some of these situations? Honestly, I find it's more about the psychological aspect than the actual coaching. They just want to have somebody to talk to that they can relate to, that they feel comfortable with. A lot of times they have um, several different counselors, doctors working with them and it's not working and it's like I'm the last resort, somebody that they can trust, that they feel that they can open up to. And so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I have my master's in, in kinesiology and I have counseling type courses that I've taken. and. You know, so I do have some basic training, not as much as I'd like, but certainly better than nothing. So I do feel that I'm able to help, not as much as I'd want to, but it's better than nothing. And I mean, they have access to, trust me, people that are hiring me for coaching, they have access to whatever they need. So I'm just a, an icing on the cake, so to speak. Let's take it back to kind of language, because a lot of my framing and language around food is about helping people develop better emotional relationships to eating, especially like we were talking about with disordered eating patterns. So I'm curious, do you think that extreme calorie and macro counting ever leads to these patterns in disordered eating? I find it's definitely a question of like what came first, the chicken or the egg? And anything done to the extreme always is gonna possess some form of a, a problem or potential to be a problem. I find that happens all the time, but the people that are um, that develop eating disorders and whatnot, there's almost always something in their personality that is coming out where they're they're obsessive compulsive. There's always something else that's kind of leading to that. And so they might have been, for example, a normal eater as a five, six, seven, eight year old, and eventually they start tracking calories and then they become obsessive to the point of how many calories are in that 
uh, sweetener that I'm putting in my coffee and it's like, is it one or two calories? And I'm like, does it matter? But they need to know. So you can kind of see a point where the tracking of calories becomes way obsessive. And I'm like, you can't even track that accurately anyway. It's gonna say zero calories on that mustard, but it's probably three, rounded down. So do you really know how many calories you're taking? And then when it's done to that grade of a degree, when 46 grams of protein or 48, and I'm like, call it 50 like really like do you care so that is when it gets to a problem and i have seen that is that's obviously a percentage of people maybe it's one percent of people that start tracking calories calories are going to get that problem later on but i mean there's no way to end it it's not to say no one should be tracking calories no one should be like looking at how much calories are in food because what if someday they develop some kind of a disorder I think you need to educate and be educated and realize that there are going to be some problems that arise, but there's not really anything we can do about it. I mean, recognize that it might happen. And if it gets to that point, like then let's worry about it. Yeah, no, I, I hear you on that. So it's interesting that you only see that in like 1%. So that's very interesting that that's kind of the case for, for the demographic that's, that's coming your way. Yeah, I don't see a crazy large percentage of people that are tracking calories and are just being like, oh my God, ever since I started tracking calories, I, I don't know what to do with myself anymore. It's a very small percentage of people that are taking it to that great of an extreme that it's affecting their life in a negative way. So talking about calories, what are your thoughts on cheat days? And like, do you do them? Do you recommend them for your clients? Talk to me about cheat days. I have for my entire life been against the whole cheat day principle and it's prevalent in contest prep diets for, for bodybuilders, bikini competitors, or just generally anyone on a diet. It's kind of like, let's eat great all week, starve ourselves and then once a week let's binge and they post their binges and it would drive me bonkers it would be 10,000 calories and then they write things like oh i got sick after and i'm like what percentage of those people are actually keeping all those calories down and being a coach having coached so many people and people confiding so many people i would say 25 percent of people who are having these binge days end up throwing up after they're not actually keeping all that food down because imagine you're on a 1500 calorie diet all week. You just ate 6,000 calories because it's your cheat day. Then the guilt sets in and you're like, well, I, I, I can't keep this down. So if you restrict so hard all week and then binge that one day, it's not gonna happen. And even a cheat meal, any cheat meal, to me, it's not a free for all. Like some people are like, I'm gonna eat whatever I want all day Saturday. To me, that's too long. Even whatever I want in one meal, that's too long. I can put back 5,000 calories with ease in 30 minutes. So if somebody said, hey, just eat anything on this diet and then, you know, one meal a week, you can eat whatever you want. 5,000 calories is what I want. Two, you know, two two liter ice creams, easy. Four liters of ice cream later, then it's like, well, I, I shouldn't have done that. So I'm 100% against the, the cheat meals. I do think people should be allowed to eat off meal, off like whatever they're, some people are eating so restrictive, chicken, broccoli and rice. I'm like, you can't eat that every day. You should be able to eat at any time during any day on any diet, something that you want in moderation. That way you're not being overly restrictive and you won't get to the point where you want to binge, cheat and your willpower, it's only gonna last so long. So by allowing people to have that treat every single day, something, they're not gonna get to the point where they need a cheat day. Yeah, no, I'm the exact same way. I, I think it's so easy to undo the caloric deficit in like one meal, one day, whatever, when you get into that cheat day, cheat meal mentality. Like the first few bites of ice cream is always gonna taste the best. Once you first get to bite, pint two, bite. <laughs> once you get to pint two, it's just like, oh, I'm eating this because it's like the last supper mentality where you know that you need to eat it all because tomorrow the diet starts again. But it's not actually enjoyable anymore. Absolutely, we've got the law of diminished returns. So Jesse James, I don't know if you know who this guy is, popular YouTuber, he's always like, last bite, best bite. No, the first bite's the best bite. And as you keep eating, the fuller you get, the less you want to eat more. So I always tell people, eat till you're full or satiated, but not till you're stuffed. If you start doing that, it's just a big mistake. And I hate the concept of like a cheat meal, like it, like the way you see as 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 a vilifying food. That's how I feel about using the word cheat meal. I want to call it an off meal plan because it's not a cheat. Like somebody's like, "What's your favorite cheat meal?" I'm like, "Well, if I say pizza, does that mean pizza's cheating?" No, I eat pizza often, so it doesn't mean usually it's a lower calorie version of it. But even if it's not, it's not 
a cheat meal, it's just me eating out. It's part of my diet. I'm allowed to do that every single day, not all day and not a 16 inch pizza. Maybe I'll have four or five slices, but not eight. That's the difference between kind of having balance and just kind of eating like a cheat meal per se. Yeah, and I totally agree. I think that that's it. You want to incorporate the meals you enjoy regularly enough that you don't feel the need to overindulge in them or overeat them on that off day or cheat day. Now, as a coach, you probably work with a lot of young women looking to change their body. So I'm curious, over the years, do you think the influence of social media has become more dangerous for them? It's gotten way worse and it's completely changed when I, I'm 45 years old. So when I was young, it was about being a rake. You had to look like a javelin. You had to be skinny everywhere. It's completely changed now so that you gotta be just as skinny in the stomach but have curves everywhere. So people are resorting to um, surgeries to get all the, the implants and uh, Brazilian butt lifts. And that's not enough. You still gotta shrink the waist down with the, uh, the apps that you can control. And it's not just still photos, it's literally a video. I made a video once, I don't know how to do it, but I got somebody to do it. And I was walking around and I shrunk my waist six inches. Six inches, tiny. And so people see that and they think it's actually them but it's not, you can get rid of all the blemishes, you can change the curves and you're already sucking in your stomach and getting the best possible lighting and doing everything. So every image we see now, it's amplified that much. I mean, 25 years ago, it wasn't as bad. The, the standards were different. Everyone had to be really skinny, but now it's more like impossible curves that you can't have unless you're genetically blessed that one in a million that could have it, but that's the new standard and everyone wants to have it. Yeah, it's so toxic, it's so dangerous because obviously we don't all look that way and we're, it's like everyone walking on the street is now becoming the same person. It's, it is alarming to me. Um, but I'm curious, what does healthy mean to you? And do you think larger body people can be both physically larger and yet healthy at the same time? Well, health to me is like, first of all, the absence of disease, you, you can't be sick. And next, we have three main components to me. There's the mental, the physical, and the social. And so mentally healthy being like loving yourself, like I'm proud of myself, you're 300 pound, 400, it doesn't matter. You're missing an arm, you're, you have no legs, you're, you love yourself mentally, you're, you're great. And then the social aspect, you have confidence, you can talk to people, you're not shy, you're not stuck in your house, you're, you have the ability to, to go out with friends and, and be happy. But then the physical, that's where, that's where it's hard to be healthy per se at any size because if you're 600 pounds on that 600 pound life show, you're not healthy automatically. No matter what we want to tell them, like you're healthy at any, you're not. You're not actually healthy. You might be healthy in the other components, you might be, you know, you love your body, it's great, and you have friends, and you go out, and that's great, but if you're 600 pounds, you can't be healthy. You can be healthier if you do cardio, you do weights, you lift and eat, and you're doing all these things, and, and it's healthy away, you can get healthier, and I'm all about being the, the healthiest version of yourself. If you're 600 pounds, you probably weren't born to be 200, but you could probably be halfway. It's 400 pounds, a lot healthier than 600, so why not do your best to get halfway to what would be considered the, the ideal. It's not about being perfect, it's about being the best that you can be for yourself. Yeah, and, and I, I'm a big believer in trying to you know focus on being what's best for you as well. I think that's a really important step and that's gonna be, that, that ideal is going to be different for different people and unfortunately we live in a society where we really only idealize one particular body type. So I agree that if you're 600 pounds, yeah, there are going to be obvious physical issues going on with your health and that trying to take on some of these healthier behaviors that affect one's weight is probably going to be a really good thing for you to do. And I can say firsthand, firsthand experience being a bodybuilder, professional bodybuilder, having done so many competitions, I'm my least healthy when I look my best. So I, per, if I could be 5% body fat, the, the ripples, I love that but I don't feel healthy, I feel like garbage. So that's why I keep preaching to people, don't try to be like me when I'm doing these bodybuilding calls. It, it's not 
easy. It's, it's in fact the opposite. It's a nightmare. I'm so weak. Sometimes I'm laying in the bath. I'm like, I can't stand up. I don't know how I have to get driven to the gym sometimes because I don't trust my ability to drive because I can't focus. I can't concentrate. 5% body fat. I would say that's the closest to death that I've ever been. Not only that, when I do a bodybuilding contest, I have to dehydrate my body. I'm losing five to 10 pounds of water, cutting out water for hours on end, using diuretics, abusing PEDs. It is not healthy. If you get my blood work done, blood pressure's not be as good, cholesterol's not in balance. But in my off season, when I'm not doing all these things and more of a healthy weight, the most healthy, even the last bodybuilding show I did, which was two years ago, I had to stop bike riding because I'd get out 30 minutes and I was like, I don't know how I'm making it back. It's so hard because I'm when you're at 5% below that, there's no energy. You don't feel good. It's a nightmare. So as much as that 600 pound person is not healthy, I think it's equally not healthy to be on the opposite extreme, the opposite spectrum. So to me, it's equal. I actually did a video on that. What's more dangerous, being obese or being a bodybuilder? And I'm like, if you take bodybuilding to the extreme or obesity to the extreme, they're equal. They are literally shortening your life. So that's why I've kind of, now that I've gotten older, I'm 45, I'm just on HRT, which is just a low dose testosterone prescribed by a doctor. And I have balance. I'm not trying to overly diet and I'm racing bicycles and I feel better. So somewhere in the middle, that's where you need to be. And don't strive to be perfect. Just try to be the best that you can be. You get to a certain percent body fat diet and you start lacking that energy and not feeling good, you gotta cut it off. That's it, that's enough. Just love yourself enough to accept that you don't need to be shredded to be a good person. And I'm just curious, I'm hearing you talk about how horrible it sounds to me to be at that body fat percentage and to be in that competitive mode. What is driving you to do that, knowing that it's not good for your physical health and it clearly is not good, to, you don't feel good. What is the motivation there? Great question. And basically the first 42 shows I did as a bodybuilder were all natural. And so if you're doing it natural, you're not going to take it to that far of an extreme. So my body fat would have been more of a normal, not that it's normal, but more in that six, 7% range, a lot more doable and it's temporary. And why do I do it? Because it was the one thing that I was really good at that I was put on this earth that I could excel at. And the feeling you get from being successful and taking on a challenge and overcoming that. And it's not about the plastic trophy people think it's a oh you just get a plastic trophy it's no it's taking on a challenge that I set out to do and that I achieved it just like climbing my Mount Everest is not healthy doing the tour to France riding your bicycle for six hours a day that's not healthy running ultra marathons where you're running for 14 hours straight is not healthy but when you're so good at something and you're really great at that you just pursue that I think everyone in life is kind of like they want to be good at something, whatever that is, and you tend to do it. If I was great at painting, I'd be painting all the time. I'm just, I'm not. I wanted to be a great triathlete. I focus, I train so hard for it. I got okay. But when I discovered bodybuilding and I started to do my first contest and I'm winning, I was like, wow, I'm really good at this. So you want to keep being the best version of yourself. So, so that kind of answers that question. Not everyone can relate unless you're an athlete or unless you're really, you know, trying to be the best in the world at something. It's hard to understand, but that is why it's the passion. You wake up every day with this goal and you're driven. I'm like, I'm going to do that, but I do know it's temporary. I'm not going to do that 5% body fat and do it forever. So it's a temporary suffering. Maybe I do it once every, I haven't done a show in two years. So it's kind of something that you do every now and then you push yourself for a little bit and it's only really that hard the last month. So it's not really, you know, the entire time is not bad. So you have that one bad month of wow. And then it's over and you get back to normal. Okay. So that's super interesting to me. I, I, and I, and that's what I understood. I always thought of it as like being like, basically like just an athlete. You see that as you know, your job and as something that you're working towards because of a personal goal. And I totally respect that. I mean, I know that that's not something that I would want to aspire to do, but I totally get why people do and what people get out of that. So thanks for sharing that. That's really interesting, but I'm curious. What are you fed up with in the wellness space? What have you had enough of? What frustrates me the most is the more spews for more views, the lies that people are saying, they'll say this, they'll misinterpret science, they'll be like, hey, you can get abs in two weeks or you can eat anything you want as long as it's not carbs and it's after 12. And it's like, really? I can eat as much steak and butter as I want and lose weight? Yup. 
What? So that is what drives me bonkers. And that's basically what I've made a career out of. I take misinformation that people are given and I correct it on the internet and I don't feel guilty about it. I'm like telling you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Y'all want to hear you can eat whatever you want. As long as you don't eat carbs, you go keto, you're going to lose all the weight you want. Go vegan. Hey, you can eat whatever you want vegan and you're going to lose weight. No. So that is what I base my channel on. That's what really like grinds my gears, really pisses me off when I see somebody straight out lying. Cryotherapy is going to burn off 500 calories. Really, in three minutes, standing in freezing cold temperature, I'm burning 500 calories. Buy me that machine. Problem is, it doesn't work. So I see these people doing that and you find out they have a, a company that they're investing in that has the cryo and it's like, yeah, now I get it. You're just trying to lie to people to make money. People don't have integrity. So that is a huge problem for me. Yeah, a hundred percent. And like you, that's also kind of where, what I've made my whole career out of as well is taking down that misinformation. And there's an endless supply of it. So I think we'll be in, we'll have work for a, a long, long time to come, unfortunately. Yeah, um, with the but, invention of TikTok, I mean, there's endless content at this point. Oh my gosh, it's it's so bad. TikTok is really the worst. It's the worst of the worst, that's for sure. Thank you so much, Greg. This was so much fun. Um, it so, was. Yeah, so we're gonna definitely leave all of your links to your videos and your channel and your website and your cookbook. I will leave those links below in the description. So thank you again for coming on. I'm sure there will be some more great collabs in the future. So thank you again. Absolutely, it was a pleasure. Well, folks, that is all that I have for you guys today on my new series, Fed Up. Thank you so much for watching. If there's someone specific that you would love to see me interview on this series, definitely leave me a comment below. Until then, do not forget to give this video the thumbs up, leave me lots of comments, lots of love, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.